Thanks, Jen. Awesome. Uh, really excited to be here with you all today. And, um, you know, obviously I'm joined by my coworker, Jen, and our coworker, Trey, is also here. And it's really great to see all of you, some familiar faces and some new people calling in really from all over the world. Um, I know that, you know, many of you here in this room probably have a lot of experience and wisdom to offer. So as Jen said, we're really hoping that today's session can be interactive. So please, you know, use the chat function. Feel free to jump in. Jen is also there to support um, in interjecting at any time too. So um, yeah, looking forward to diving in. I'll share a little bit about my background. And also, as Jen said, um, I'm based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, kind of in the heart of some of the um, racial equity issues that have come up in the last few weeks. So also happy to share a little bit about that. Um, but I'll start with, um, with my background. So as I said, I'm based here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but I actually grew up in Montreal and I've had the privilege to live and work all over the world. And when I was about 16, I learned about the impact that humans were having on the planet, particularly how we're impacting climate. And so I got really passionate about um, working on the climate crisis. And I went on to study environmental studies and geography. And after I graduated, I worked in international development um, with nonprofits and several startups, mostly in project and event and program management. And I had the chance to work on some really cool teams, which sparked a lot of what my work is today. So I worked on um, in a couple of global networks in the internet governance space and also in the regenerative agriculture space. I had the chance to manage a small grants program for the, the Web Foundation. Um, and I worked in vertical farming at a vertical farming startup in Montreal. And, and all of that kind of led me to stumble into the regenerative agriculture movement. Some of you may be familiar with that term, but it um, kind of goes beyond organic and having a net positive impact on the planet. And so um, with that, I really learned that we can reverse climate change and restore ecosystems. And so I spent a number of years working in that space, um, helping to crowdfund for agroforestry systems, working with small scale farmers and working with global networks to um, create more connectivity and interconnection and collaboration in that movement. Um, but through all those experiences, it really generated this passion inside me for helping organizations and people and networks working to solve complex issues be reach their full potential so that we can have a, so that we can co-create a better world and really that's what led me to in rhythm and for those of you who don't know in rhythm we're a management and design consultancy um, and we focus on revealing potential in people and in organizations and we do that by taking a living regenerative approach and we serve as a resource to organizations all over the world working to address some of those complex issues that I mentioned earlier. And so I'm looking forward to sharing more about our approach today. Um, but first, I really wanted to just acknowledge a couple of things. Um, you know, I know many of us are going through a difficult time right now with COVID. Each of us are experiencing that in, in different ways. And then on top of that, really what has emerged in the last couple of weeks with um, George Floyd is that we need systems change and the inequities are really bring, being brought to light right now. And as Jen said, I'm, I'm based in Powderhorn Park in Minneapolis, really in the heart of you know, several blocks from where hundreds of businesses were burned to a couple of blocks from where the incident occurred with George Floyd. And so I'm right now just feeling really grateful to be a part of a community that's standing up for systems change. And you know, last week or on Sunday, our city council unanimously voted to defund the Minneapolis Police Department. And so I think there's just growing widespread recognition that we need to regenerate the potential in the systems that we've created and focus on building healthy systems. So I'm excited um, for today's topic because it's really the focus of the work of In Rhythm. And, and yeah, I think it's needed more now than ever. So with that, uh, you know, you've had the chance to learn a little bit about me, a little bit about In Rhythm, but we also would love to learn a little bit more about you. I find on webinars, uh, it's great to give people the opportunity to, you know, make connections. So if you could, I know some of you have been, but if you could type in the chat where you're calling in from, if you're here associated with an organization, feel free to include that. And then also, what brought you here and what are you curious about? So I'm just going to give you all a minute to type. Um, and we'd love, you know, Jen, feel free to read a couple out loud. Sure. I know we've got some folks calling in from Colorado, Columbia. But yeah, just take a second. I'd love to hear, you know, a little bit about what brought you here and what you're curious about. So I'll pause, I'll give you a sec to type. And this just really gives you all the, the, the opportunity to create some connections with one another too. 
I find I've met some really interesting people on webinars in this way. Yeah, Marlo, I'm calling in from Phoenix, Arizona. I am with a purpose-driven executive search firm called Y Scouts, referred by Trey, and have a passion for people, business, and missions. So thanks for joining, Marlo. Yeah, thanks for joining. Got Samantha and Hogsback, that's awesome. I've been to Hogsback. Me beautiful, too. Beautiful part of the world. Yeah. Yeah, hello there. Yeah, Bernardo from Rio. Bernardo from Rio, Brazil. Got a B Corp called Ionica, develop, developing an accelerator of regenerative business with Sanal. Cool. Nice. Very cool. Yes. Awesome. Well, keep it coming. We, we want to hear from you all and also give you all the chance to connect with one another and just let us know who you're here with and where you're calling in from. So thanks was, again for joining. Sorry, Jen. Yeah, school district. That was awesome. Yeah. Cool. That's great. Awesome. So with that, we're going to dive into the topic of today. So a little bit about what to expect. So we're going to start with talking about the state of organizations. We're going to talk about a new metaphor for organizations going to introduce you to in rhythms design approach and then we're going to save some time at the end for a little bit of discussion and as we've said a couple of times now we just want you to know this is super interactive we're going to call out questions throughout this webinar and love if you could jump in in the chat and let us know your thoughts and Jen will read the comments out loud and and we're going to save some time for discussion at the end we've got a couple of the in rhythm team here who are going to jump in and join for that too all right so when you think about what our organizations are designed after, what would you say is the most dominant metaphor? So what do you think of, what do you think of when you think of our companies, our organizations? Just type your responses into the chat. What comes to mind? What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think about organizations? Profit. Maybe um, talk about the question one more time. Yeah, so when you think about a, a metaphor that describes what an organization is, what comes to mind? For some, it might be really good, like they're yeah. fulfilling or something. And we've got top down instability machine. Yeah, instability, top down profit. Yeah, those are all things that come to mind. I think some of you have an enlightened view of what our organizations are predominantly designed after. Um, we focus on, like, first of all, why, why metaphors? Metaphors are important because they shape how we think, they shape our worldview, and they can influence how we make decisions and how we design. So it's important to understand what the underlying metaphors are and how we're, we're seeing the world. And so some of you pinpointed that the, the dominant metaphor really across all in sectors for organizations is the machine right and here's two random examples from a quick google so on the on the right hand side you've got a consulting firm describing how you could describe how you could design your business as a machine and then on the left you've got georgia's economic engine with all the different departments of the state of georgia as gears and so you know some of you pointed out that the focus is really on productivity, efficiency, and effectiveness, and it's on driving outcomes, right? So this machine metaphor is really deeply ingrained into how we think about, how we design, how we operate our organizations. And here are two more examples. So the one on the left is a, a, an excerpt from a book that a friend who's completing her MBA here in Minneapolis recently shared. It's from a book called Talent Management in the 21st Century. It's used as a part of their their MBA program. And basically it's describing a proposal for how businesses can look to supply chain inventory models as a, as a model for employee management. So they're describing employees as perishable commodities, right? And on the right, you see a couple of different uh, examples of change management in the field of change management, looking at organizations as machines and how we actually create change as a mechanistic model. And so the machine metaphor is really embedded in how we think about our businesses on so many different levels. And if we take it to another level, we even look at our human bodies as machines. So on the left, we've got an image from the 20th century, from a 20th century textbook, looking at uh, comparing our human body organs as different parts of machines. And on the right, we've got, you know, different examples of 
um, what are those things called? Little icons that you know you generate on the internet, maybe you use on a website, which are looking at our our human brains as machines. And what I've been finding, and what in rhythm's been finding, and in this machine metaphor, is that so much of our even our personal development work is oriented towards rebooting or rewiring our operating systems. And we talk about how we're hardwired and driven and even burnt out. I mean, how many of you? just by a you know, show in the chat, how many of you have used one of these machine-based idioms to describe yourself in the last week? You know? can you, and can you think of any others? Feel free to type those in the chat too. So the machine metaphor is really ingrained in so much of what we do, even prominent business leaders like American billionaire Ray Dalio. He is the founder of Bridgewater Associates. He's even in this image, it's a Facebook, uh, sorry, an Instagram post. He's describing thinking of yourself as a machine. Jen, maybe you could read this one if you can unmute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Think of yourself as a machine operating within a machine and know that you have the ability to alter your machines to become, to produce better outcomes. Thanks, yeah. So prominent business leaders are even recommending thinking of yourself as a machine. This was only posted a few months ago. So it's very embedded in our culture, right? In our business and our organizational culture. And I'd like to pose this question to you. What are the consequences of treating and designing our organizations as machines and therefore humans as parts of a machine? Phil, type your responses in the chat. What do you think? What's going on? We've got lose the human touch and connection, dehumanization. Yes. Yeah. Others? Burnout. No room for real change. Yeah, totally. These are all examples of consequences of what happens when we utilize the machine metaphor in, in human systems in our organizations. Yeah, I like Daniel's. It's not regeneratively resilient. There you go. Loss of creativity, too. These are great. Spot on, you guys. So in, with, at in rhythm, we think about this at a, on a meta level as well, okay? So we think about the outcomes are, of running our machines as a, oh, sorry, our machines. I even called them machines. <laughs> we think about, when we think about the outcome of running our organizations as a whole, you know, from our government to our foundations to for-profit businesses to nonprofit organizations, we look at the impact that this is having on the planet. This is one way to think about this on a meta level. So this is the Living Planet Index, and it's an indicator of the state of global biodiversity. And I'm sure that I don't need to reiterate to you that biodiversity loss is in, you know, directly related with human activity, and we're seeing a decline in that. And so as a result of the design of our systems, biodiversity is declining. And the machine metaphor hasn't been great for people either. Every year there's an organization in the US that is called Gallup, and they do a study looking at employee engagement and in 2019, they found that only 35% of people are engaged at work. Think about that. 65% of people are either disengaged or actively disengaged. That's a huge amount of potential that isn't being fulfilled there. People are disengaged at work, 65%. That's crazy. We spend, you know, 10, 8 to 10 hours a day at work. That's a lot, long time to be disengaged. And not only that, but it comes at a huge cost to the economy. Here in the US alone, it's estimated that disengaged employees cost the economy 450 billion to 550 billion in lost productivity every year. Uh, not to mention the toll on you know, people's mental health and well-being and all of the, the things that come along with, with disengagement, right? And then as a millennial, I wanted to point out specifically the impacts uh, that this machine metaphor and design has been having on, on millennials. We're actually the least engaged generation at work. Only 29% of millennials are engaged at work. And some statistics indicate that we make up about 38% of the workforce. And by 2025, we're going to make up as much as 75% of the workforce. So just some food for thought in terms of thinking about the need to shift our design um, especially in light of, you know, the future of the workforce. I still have hope for you min millennials. <laughs> I do. I, I do too. I have change a in the world, change in the world. <laughs> it's just taking time. Um, and then from an equality perspective, as a result of the current design, there's individuals that are wealthier that have 
a greater net worth than entire countries. This is just one example of that. So the design is really benefiting the few at the top, leading to huge inequality. And then from an equity perspective, at least here in the US, um, race is still the greatest predictor of how well you'll do with regards to jobs, housing, arts and culture, education. This is a huge issue. This is what's coming to light right now, particularly in the last couple of weeks. We need to change the design of our systems in order for the systems to work for everyone, in order to have healthy systems that are equitable, right? And then here's a slide courtesy of our partners, the Gemini Group. Um, the slide basically goes through a series of Supreme Court cases that, that lead us to recognize why we're in this racial situation here in the US at least. I'm sure there's examples in many other, there, there are examples many, in many other countries in the world, but this, this really brings to light um, that the situation is because of the structures that were designed. And this, these examples represent the idea of how whiteness has been created here in the US. So I'm just gonna run through them here. Oops, I went a little quick. So those, so those were examples of how um, these, the inequities that we're facing are truly baked into the structures that we've created and designed in our, in our legal system here in the US. But that leads us to believe and see that this is truly a design issue. So on the one hand, it's really disheartening and frustrating to think that we've designed our systems in this way, but it's also really empowering and hopeful because we can design things differently, right? And Trey, one of our coworkers who's here on the call, he's often said, we've taken an industrial system and applied it to a living environment and it's not working. So there's something really empowering about that, right? What if we took a new approach? But I just wanted to recognize that, of course, we see the limitations with designing with the machine metaphor in mind, but it's also important to recognize that it had great value at the time and it's important to recognize where it came from so the machine metaphor was originally born out of the industrial age um, newton and other great thinkers made huge breakthroughs in in science and provided the, par the paradigm that really characterized things like rationalism logic cause and effect prediction and control and this paradigm really served as the philosophical foundation for democracy, human rights, social justice, and so much of our Western civilization. And, you know, for one, the discovery of cause and effect disrupted how we think about fate and divine rights. And so Newton did such a great job, Newton and other thinkers at the time did such a great job in helping to explain these physical laws that govern the universe that we've spent the last 300 or so years applying this scientific reductionist mechanical approach to all aspects of our human endeavors, which is what we're seeing in our organizations and systems today. But even Einstein recognized the limitations of this reductionist machine approach in the 60s. And so here's what he said. When the number of factors coming into play in a phenomenological complex is too large, the scientific method in most cases fails. One only need think of the weather, in which case the prediction, even for a few days ahead, is impossible. So what Einstein's pointing to is that when we're dealing with complex systems, we can't predict the outcomes. We can't because they're complex. We can't control them either. And so this is just beginning the recognition that the machine approach just doesn't work everywhere. And so here, here's one way to think about systems, specifically complicated versus complex systems. And you could think of a system as a project, an organization, a network, an ecosystem. Um, many people use these two words, complicated and complex, interchangeably, but the reality is that they have very different, very different meanings and when it comes to designing and managing systems. So on the left, if we think about complicated systems, they've got uh, inputs, and then you follow a series of steps, and then we've got predictable outputs. So in complicated systems, we can predict and control, right? Um, complicated problems can be hard to solve, but they're addressable with rules and recipes and that series of steps that it takes to get those outputs. So when I think about complicated systems, I like to think about IKEA furniture, right? I want to receive my IKEA furniture with a set of instructions I might drink a lot of wine while I'm putting it together because it can be pretty frustrating to put together IKEA furniture, 
but I receive a series, you know, I receive materials, which are the inputs. I receive a series of steps and I usually will get a bookshelf if I, if I put it together correctly by following those steps, right? Um, and then on the right, we look at complex systems. Complex systems are very different than complicated systems. They've got dense interdependencies, many actors involved. Uh, when change happens, it's nonlinear. And there's a lot of unknowns. So the system quickly becomes unpredictable and we can't predict and control a complex system. You can't follow a set of instructions or best practices to be able to manage a complex system. If you, if you can think of a, I'd actually love to hear from some of you all if, if you want to just type into the chat some examples that come to mind when you think about what a complex system might be. Just take a second. Just what, what comes to mind when you think of a, something that might be complex versus complicated? Anyone want to type an example into the chat? Yep, the economy, my body. Yep, those are great. Business, health. Yeah, these are all examples of complex systems, right? And if I were to give you a set of best practices to say, you know, go manage nature in this way, it wouldn't necessarily work the same in one environment as in the other. And so what we're learning is that um, complicated approach to solving problems is great for things that we make. Think about that IKEA furniture example, whereas Complex systems are things that we manage. And the most significant challenges that we're facing today are complex in nature. You listed some of them, right? There are issues like growing your business, transforming culture, there's social and environmental issues, it's agriculture and policy and poverty and food security and equity and equality and climate change and our bodies, like one of you mentioned in the chat. And so the issue has been that people have been trying to solve complex challenges and treating complex systems as if they are complicated ones. And that's the problem. Um, the two ways of, of thinking about these two types of systems are very different. They involve different mindsets, different expectations, and different, you know, levels of, of ambiguity. And so, yeah, as I, as I said, we're realizing that complicated systems are things that we make and complex systems are things that we manage and we cannot use the same frameworks and management approaches in both. So just to really hit this one home, when you see these two images, complex or complicated, type it into the chat. Complicated, yes, spot on. And how about these? Complex or complicated? Complex, you got it. Right, so there's really a growing recognition across a variety of industries from healthcare to schools that our social systems are complex systems and we need to learn how to manage that complexity in a different way. So here at In Rhythm, we believe that we're in the middle of another shift in perception and we don't feel like this is gonna be known as the digital age or the Facebook age or the millennial age to my dismay. Just kidding. Uh, we're, we think it's going to be known as the age of complexity and whether or not we figured out how to manage complex living systems differently. And so we need to look to new models, to new metaphors to know and understand how we can work with complexity. And nature is what we look to. And what can we learn from living systems? I mean, living systems have unique principles, characteristics that enable them to manage and work with complexity in ways that our current design of human systems, at least for the most part, or machine-based systems simply don't. So what comes to mind when you think of, of life as a metaphor? When you think of nature, what comes to mind? What models are there in, in living systems? Just feel free to type what comes to mind in the chat when you think of life as a metaphor. Evolution, nice. Life cycle of animal, any animal or insect, nice. Great, those are great examples. Soil health, biodiversity, yep. The water cycle, yeah. These are all things that we think about when we think about nature as a metaphor. Um, but if we're gonna turn to life as a metaphor, it's very important that we're clear by what we mean by that. 
there's varying theories out there and they vary in accuracy on how nature actually operates. And so here's one. This is a, this is the circle of life, Lion King, one of my favorite movies growing up. And it's based on the idea that the world is a balanced and balanced and predator prey relationships and that, you know, uh, we've got warthogs and meerkats and lions all dancing and singing together, celebrating the birth of a new Lion King. And, but we all know that the animal kingdom is not full of dancing lions and singing warthogs and meerkats, unfortunately. And the reality is a lot more, is a lot harsher than that, right? And so this model of life, like many others, isn't necessarily accurate or one we could really look to to draw true living system science into how we can apply that to our organizations. And so, you know, up until now, even the field of biology has really had a hard time defining what life is. And we go into, you know, understanding in depth living system science in our foundations of regenerative organizations online course. So I'm not going to go into it in too much depth here, but just to give you a broad overview, um, one only recently has a group of scientists in Chile actually called um, Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela. They're from the Santiago school. They approached this question of what is life from a truly systems approach, not a mechanistic um, not a mechanistic reductionist approach. And so what they did is they took a cell and recreated it in a test tube. And what they discovered is that they could re recreate the cell completely, but it would lack one ability in the test tube. And that was the ability to, to self-maintain. And all of the pathways interacting with, within a cell wouldn't be able to self-maintain when it was recreated. And so they developed this definition that we really use in our work um, around what living means and what living systems are. And so the definition is, life is an organized system capable of maintaining itself within a boundary of its own making. And so for us, living truly equals regenerative and regenerative equals living. So regenerative is really a defining aspect or quality of life that we design to. And yeah, as I said, we go into you know the, the science for those of you who may be a little bit um, nerdier on the call or want to go into that in more depth, encourage you to check out our foundations of regeneration, regenerative organizations online course. But to this, and the, for the purpose of this webinar, this is just for you to know that, you know, we, we ground and rhythm grounds our approach deeply in this definition of, of life and what living is when we talk about using life as a metaphor to, to work, work at organizations and to design organizations too. All right, so you're probably asking yourself, all right, I've learned a lot about life and machines, but how are, you know, how are we really going to apply this to organizations, right? So let's just do a brief recap on what we've learned so far. So we looked at machine design and that when we engineer best practices, we reinforce prescriptive structures. You know, most of us have been asked to use best practices in our organizations by, uh, with the assumption that what works in one place will work the same in the other. And I think that it's been held true that that's not necessarily always the case. Um, and then those prescriptive structures actually end up degenerating health when we apply this to social systems, right? But in contrast, when we start with living systems, those inform the living systems and the science of living systems informs the principles that we use as a means for design. And a principle-based approach, well, we're going to go more into what principles means shortly, um, and a principle-based approach actually facilitates the use of flexible frameworks that we use to manage complexity. And when we use flexible frameworks and living systems principles to manage, we are actually able to regenerate the health of social systems, of our organizations, of our networks, of our communities. And we can keep this aspect of self-regeneration that we just learned about um, through the Santiago School. We can keep the, that aspect of self-regeneration alive. So taking this approach is ultimately regenerating the health of the system when we are um, working in social systems. And it's also recognizing that when we apply the machine design to social systems, it actually takes more energy and it takes more external outputs versus when we 
when we apply, when we take the living systems approach, I'm just seeing in the chat. Thanks for, thanks for joining, Jamie. I just wanted to say thank you and goodbye. Just saw your chat. Um, sorry, everyone <laughs> got distracted. So, um, and then when we apply living systems design to social systems, it takes less energy and those systems are able to self-maintain. And it's not that one approach, it's not that the machine approach is good or bad. It's not that living systems design is good or bad. It's simply a matter of what systems and what situations we use them in, whether it's complicated or complex. And I think where we've gone wrong as humanity is assuming that we can apply this machine design to everything that we do. Uh, when in reality, um, our organizations are living systems and we need a different management and design approach. And so this is the approach that in rhythm uses here in the green. And Can I interrupt you really quick. There was a question. Yeah, totally. Um, Lauren asked, what's the difference between prescriptive structure and healthy boundaries? I think of this in terms of design, defining roles on a team. Yeah, I, that's a great question, Lauren. I think part, we, what we could do is get to that question on when we look at the framework that in rhythm uses as a means for design, because it certainly a huge part of any organization is designing structures that enable the health of a team or an organization. And so we certainly, you know, I think there's a common misconception that, you know, in, in maybe in maybe living organizations or seeing organizations as ecosystem, there's no structure and no design, but there's certainly in our approach, a very intentional process that you go through to be able to create structure and recognizing that structure can evolve without taking the prescriptive approach that you typically would. So I hope that helps to answer at least a little bit now before we talk a little more about structures later, Lauren. Awesome. Um, yeah, so, you know, just so on the shifts piece, our, we recognize that this living systems approach to designing and managing organizations is going to take shifts both in our perspectives and in our operations. And so a lot of our work at Rhythm is really focused on that aspect of things. And that's what we focus a lot of our client work on too. Um, all right. So what on earth do we mean by principles? <laughs> all right, so as I said, living systems inform the design principles that we use as the basis for framing you know, our questions and the guiding our design in our organizations. And before I kind of go into explaining the principles, I just wanted to give a shout out to, you know, at least for those who are familiar with the regenerative space, you'll know that there's many sets of principles out there to design to. And in Rhythm, we're not gonna pretend that our set of principles is the only one out there, but this is what we've gleaned from the science that we draw our work from. And we use these as a means for design and totally honor, you know, those out there who are also working in this space and may have other sets of principles. We actually have a great blog that it goes into more depth on our design principles, which I'd encourage you to, to check out in rhythm.co slash blog. Um, but to give you a little bit of an overview here, we designed to six principles that are informed by living system science. The, the first is holism and they're in no particular order. Holism is recognizing that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And so operationally, that means in an organization, you value the entirety of the system and you're creating the conditions for abundance and resilience and impact to emerge from the interdependent contributions of all of your team members, your clients and your partners. So it goes beyond that narrow view of our success is the only success that matters, for example. It's about creating an ecosystem of team members, clients and partners. Um, interdependence, inherent value of all relationships. So that's recognizing that our recognizing the complexity of our deep interdependence with our clients, suppliers, partners, and even our competitors. And then we've got uniqueness. Uniqueness is, the orig is about originality and the possibility of individual genius. It's recognizing that each person in an organization is unique. And when we foster the expression of the genius of all team members, we can allow for even more potential to emerge uh, within an organization. So designing around that uniqueness is very key. And then we've got evolutionary. Evolutionary is about maintaining a dynamic balance with ever-changing environmental conditions. I think evolutionary is particularly important right now in light of, you know, honestly, the COVID crisis. And, you know, we've all had to pivot our organizational strategies and change our strategic plans and all that. Um, so evolutionary is about 
both responding to and creating change in our organizational environment to maintain a dynamic balance with constant change, because change is probably the only thing that's constant. And then there's nodal, which is about decentralized and distributed. Nodal is about not relying on centralized command and control structures and allowing all members of the system to be resourced and empowered decision makers. So it's shifting from that hierarchical approach to a nodal distributed network approach. And then lastly, there's developmental and developmental is about the growth and the health of the members in the system. And so that's in an, in an organization creating the condition conditions for all members to grow and thrive with the health of the system. So those are our design principles. Encourage you to read more about them on our latest blog, maybe. Oh, sweet. Jen, you already posted the link. Awesome. Encourage you to check that out. If you're interested in diving deeper into that, you'll get a, a more in-depth overview. Um, all right. So that's a little bit about the principles. And then we talk about how this facilitates flexible frameworks. So if we just go back to that IKEA furniture example and what happens when you apply principles to complicated systems, what would happen, right? I actually would pose that question to you. What happens when you apply principles to complicated systems? What would happen if I received my set of IKEA furniture with a set of principles, you know, must stand, um, must must stand upright what what would happen if that if if i received that to my door or you received that how would you feel just feel free to type in the chat feels limiting yep what else you receive that furniture and it's probably built something other than what i expect yeah that's true so it might also be really frustrating right you know, you in complicated systems, you actually want a set of instructions and best practices. I don't want to have to guess how to bake a cake. I mean, maybe some people can do that, but <laughs> So when we apply principles to complicated systems, we usually get frustration. And similarly, What happens when you apply a sets of instructions or best practices to complex systems, right, what we're seeing in our organizations, we're trying to apply this mechanistic approach, this best practice approach to, to complex systems. What happens? How does that feel? Feel free to type into the chat. Does not achieve the desired outcome. What else? Well, I'd say here too, there's also frustration. The system's not working. We're seeing people rise up right now in, in frustration and people are fed up. We need a different design and no room for pivoting, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. we're built into that, into a rigid, a rigid system. Yeah, that's great. So we talk about how we need a new framework. We need a new kind of framework to manage complexity because the current framework is not working. And so I'll introduce you briefly today to InRhythm's regenerative framework. This is a design framework or a design process, and it's how we manage complexity in organizations and networks and communities. I'm not going to go into this in too much depth because there's a lot, there's a lot here, and we go through this in entire online courses, but just to give you a really brief overview. Um, we can think of, I'll go through this as a process from left to right, but in any living system, it starts with the context and understanding the context. And there's four elements to the context and it's really about looking at the purpose, the deep why, we look at quality of life, because it's not just about what we're trying to achieve, it's about how we want our lives to look like when we are doing that. And then we look at behaviors, we design behaviors and what behaviors are needed to achieve our quality of life and ensure the support of those in our, in our ecosystem. And then we look at supporting environment because we recognize that we are a part of systems and we impact them and they impact us. We need to design with that in mind. And then the second, in the second column here, this is organizational health. And this is something that's unique to the work of InRhythm. We focus on understanding the health of the system. So we look at four main processes. We look at energy flow, driving people, informational cycle, intelligent decision-making, communication cycle, whether communication is relevant, whether exchange is happening in a healthy way, 
And then we look at network connections, whether an organization has a diverse supportive community. And some of you earlier, when I asked you what comes to mind when you think of life, you pointed to things like the water cycle, soil. When we're talking about creating healthy organizations, when we're talking about regenerating organizations and creating regenerative organizations, it's around building the health of that system. And so this is super key. And if you take away anything from today, I want you to take away the idea that we need to create healthy organizational systems. And with that, Lauren, this comes back to your question around structures. We need to design our structures of our organizations. And by structures, I mean things like the design of our organization, roles and responsibilities, monitoring. These need to be designed first and foremost to support the health of the system. Because usually we basically just design structures around the shit that we want to get done. <laughs> the work that we want to do, right? Like usually we'll come together and we'll say, all right, we want to launch this product or we want to launch this program. Okay, how do we create structure around that? We're saying we flip that on its head and do it the other way. And so that's something that's very unique to in rhythms approach. And, and if we can do, if we can do all of that, there's kind of this aspirational piece to it, recognizing that in living systems, there's a lot that we don't know. And the challenge of managing complexity is that we will never fully know the outcome because it's probably something we can't even imagine. Right. And that's where the potential is too. And so we lean into the understanding that abundance and resilience, and impact is something, yeah, like I said, really beyond our imagination. And so we're trying to, it's about creating the conditions, it's about creating the conditions for underlying health so that we can achieve that unlimited potential. So that's a really brief elevator pitch of what In Rhythms framework is. And we go into a lot more depth in this. It's a, it's a design framework and we use this with organizations and networks and with communities. We use it with projects. Um, we also, create our own personal individual frameworks and our roles too. So it's, it's very functional at, at many different levels. So that's just a brief intro. And yeah, ultimately when we use living systems principles and flexible frameworks in social systems, we can regenerate the health of the system. And so this is our definition of what a regenerative organization is. Um, it is a living, evolving, and naturally functioning organization where abundance and resilience are recurring outcomes of its underlying health. And so here at In Rhythm, we believe that organizations are complex living systems, right? And this, this new management and design approach that we're proposing is to support the regeneration of the health of the system. And this is our living, evolving definition. And so just to... A, a recap on our design approach and, and why. So why living systems? Well, because all living systems are complex systems, including our social systems, whether it's communities or networks or, or organizations. And applying a mechanistic approach, as we've learned today, is degenerating the health of our system. Not only our ecosystems, our, our employee engagement, uh, the equity, all those things that we covered today, it's clear that that approach is not working. And then why regenerative design principles? Those six principles that we went through together today. Well, principles are how we design with complex living systems in mind. And then why flexible frameworks? Why that framework that I just introduced to you? Well, when we use regenerative design principles in conjunction with a framework, we're able to manage complexity in our organizations, in our communities, and in our networks. And so this approach results in regenerating the health of the system and unleashing potential. So it's about that abundance, creating the conditions for abundance and resilience to emerge. So that's just a high level overview of, you know, why this, why this approach, why do we look at those three elements? And with that, I'm going to leave you with a quote from systems thinker, Donella Meadows. She wrote, the world is a complex, interconnected, finite, ecological, social, psychological, economic system. We treat it as if it were not, as if it were divisible, separate, simple, and infinite. Our persistent, intractable global problems arise directly from this mismatch. So this is uh, one of our favorite quotes here at In Rhythm because it really, really brings to light 
the, the issue that we're facing and utilizing this mechanistic approach and how we really need to shift towards a, a complex living systems approach. And so with that, I leave you finally with a question. And the question is, what has shifted for you today? And, and really in all of this, it's about shifting our perceptions, shifting how we think about things, shifting our behaviors, and ultimately in our organizations about shifting our design and operations. But my hope is that today, or our hope is that today, we can leave you with at least something shifting. And so would love to hear from a couple of you in the chat, what's, what's moving for you, what's shifting? I would say um, unmute and let's hear voices. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, that sounds great. We can just dive straight into a discussion. I can end my slideshow so that we can see. So if folks have to run, please feel free. But yeah. if you can stick around, we're going to jump into a Q&A. Oh, am I still sharing my screen? There we go. Yeah. Um, thanks yeah. for joining us, everybody. If yeah, you have to go. Thanks for joining us if you've got to run. Yeah, this was fantastic. Thank you guys so much. I think with the shift, just like anything else, it's it's a personal mindset, but also a collective mindset of changing the way people think about businesses as, as a machine, right? And I, I think I'm pretty well versed on thinking about it in more of a humanistic aspect, but it's so easy when you're talking about operations or parts of a business, like even saying parts of a business, right, to, to refer to them in, in a machine way. So it is really shifting your thinking. And, uh, you know, I do think that with with what you guys are doing we have the power of changing the way we think about business and creating a world where people are engaged and um, very passionate about it and i'm so so glad i got to sit in on this so thank you very much thanks marlo really appreciate your feedback that's awesome and you know it's it's even just starting to notice those little idioms like parts of my organization showing up in our language and it's just beginning that's a shift in itself just starting to notice right and paying attention does anybody else have anything they want to share? Any reflections or or questions even? I really appreciated seeing the framework. Um, you know, I, I've been introduced just a little bit into regenerative thinking, but actually seeing the reordering of how you would go about um, business is just create a lot of food for thought. So thank you. Cool. Thanks, Jennifer. I was um, excited by um, all of it because it's something that I hadn't realized was that I'd intuitively been sort of doing a lot of that stuff um, when I was trying to do some reforms in one of my groups and it sort of made clear some of the reasons where why I sometimes ran into a brick wall and did something because it was like, oh, okay, so I switched those around and I, I, like a lot of stuff just got a lot clearer and I've got better vocabulary now to speak about what, to me, like as a leader, I was looking at these things happening and I, I didn't even know how to speak to the people around me about what I was observing, but I knew that, there was, that this was what I was seeing, you know? Oh. Thanks, Chris. That's awesome, I'm glad this brought more clarity. I'm just glad to know that y'all exist and are um, sharing this work. It's really just, um, I came into this feeling very anxious. I was on a, a call with a new client for like four hours and then I got to come here and um, get grounded again. Like I think that the work that you're offering is, it has roots and, um, a lot of people in the corporate world don't have unfortunately they don't have access to to these roots so that just feels very special so thank you for sharing the work thanks lauren i just love that you're talking about roots with your background <laughs> you're like it has roots and there's these beautiful vines and green behind you thanks appreciate that where where are you calling in from i'm in houston texas this is a fake background oh, we're in houston <laughs> we Lauren, we should connect. I'm my husband's family's from Houston. We go there frequently. So cool. Make sure I'd to love connect. to. Cool. I just wanted to say about these. Sorry, Jen. Um, 
you know, th these last few months has given people time and perspective to think. Um, and we've witnessed how degenerative um, our systems are in this world and how these systems are put into place to try to help people but they've often caused more damage recently. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, so I think it's great that more and more people are like, things need to change. Lots of things need to change. And I think that's the shift and that's, there's energy. There's a lot of energy happening behind that. So I'm excited. So. I was just going to ask a question. Um, you know, obviously, this is a huge shift from what we see in most of our organizations. And so I'm curious what your opinion would be about whether this needs to come from this shift needs to start from the top down or whether it's possible to be a grassroots effort and come from the bottom up. Oh, that's a really good question. Hmm. That's interesting. I feel like I need to think about that a little bit. Trey, do you want to jump in? I, I feel like I need to think about that. Sure. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm proud that I stumped you, Alex. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> so um, I, I think the, the challenge is uh, the kind of organization that it is. Right. And you find that some organizations have an ethos of substantial amount of empowered decision-making across, but still very hierarchical in how things are designed. And in that, a grassroots bottoms up approach can actually work uh, because there's already a structure that allows for that kind of connection and that kind of sharing of information. I find in a more traditional one, uh, definitely one that's, multinational, it crosses boundaries, there's a lot of control in place, a lot of command and control structures. And then that top down tends to be part of how things change. And so, but what I can say is it begins with awareness, which is a bottoms up approach. Because as we all know, even in a top down approach, how many times and Jen, I know you're a part of a pretty large organization and there are others and I've been a part of a lot of really large movements and decision making where even top down approaches across large numbers of people don't work. And that's, that's part of the thing that I think is misunderstood is assuming a top down approach is actually serving us well. And it actually isn't because there's so much that does not get done because if the people in the organization don't want to do it, yet they just rebel against their managers, which rebel against the directors and the VPs and everybody's continuing to struggle with how do we roll out something else. So, so to me, it's, it is the ability to recognize that we can create conditions. So we also just talk about um, supporting people in this idea of a challenge or a shift so what does it look like to shift mindsets first? What does it look like to begin to shift behaviors and then shift practices? Because if we take that approach, we begin to then have the conditions ready for people to actually make shifts in design or shifts in strategy or work. So that's kind of my thoughts. It starts with the context. It's contextual, right? There's no one size fits all approach. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Trey. Anyone else? Thoughts or reflections on that even? I've always been kind of interested about the, um, I, I wanna say the polarity of like in permaculture, they talk about hierarchy and how there is a hierarchy of like the natural world. And there's also a lot of, which it seems like a polarity to me of like a decentralized system that like I've read about in like Adrian Marie Brown's work where it's like nobody's really the leader which feels natural for like a flock maybe but they're I, I don't know I'm, I'm always kind of curious about those polarities and wonder if you guys have had conversations about 
you know, the hierarchy versus the, I don't even know what you would call, I would call the other thing. I don't have vocabulary for that, but I'm curious. Yeah, Trey, I'm going to defer that one to you. I feel like you and, Je or maybe Jeff, actually, because I feel like, okay, Jeff's our resident. <laughs> Jeff's also on the In Rhythm team, and he is, yeah, an ecologist by training and probably can speak more to his background, but um, he's dove in deep into this. So I'll, I'll hand that one to you, Jeff. I feel like you could give an enriching response. Sure. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I've been uh, kind of in and out, but great to to see you all. It's a great question, Lauren, and uh, there's not a short answer, but I'll, um, and if, again, if you read our, the blog that we, that Jen posted, we touch on it a little bit in there. Um, the short answer I'd say is, it's clear that there's many different types of relationships in living systems. There are, uh, and and is the diversity and interdependence of all of those relationships that creates the recurring abundance and recurring resilience in a system. Um, so I, I don't know if I would say it's specifically a tension between hierarchy and, and decentralized. Um, there, because there is no real kind of command and control for in a living system, right? It is, it is inherently decentralized. It's, there isn't a, uh, a, a, a wizard behind the curtain operating at all, right? It's, um, it is what it is. Um, now that said, have we as ecologists identified hierarchies? Have we put a pattern of hierarchy in our nomenclature? species, genus, family, uh, in how we think about um, living systems, I would say we have, and there are certain patterns that that's useful for, but I don't know if there is the type of hierarchy the way we've been talking about it in terms of like a C-suite that controls everything else, like in that, in that way. That was very helpful, thank you. Sure. Yeah, actually, and I actually go one step further. Interestingly, you would think the opposite to be true, but there seems to be in, a, in that family structure a little bit more of that hierarchy that exists. And the bigger it gets, the less that structure exists. Whereas in you see the opposite in our systems today, right? Oh, a little more freedom if we're a small entrepreneurial organization. The bigger it gets, the more control we put on everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a great book that came out of the quote that um, Alex put, Team of Teams, which was the complex versus complicated. Uh, General Stanley uh, McChrystal actually makes the point, being the largest organization in the world, the Army, that the only way we can do is create conditions, that the hi hierarchy is not serving us. And that's mm -hmm. the largest organization in the world. So when he was trying to uh, manage the efforts in Afghanistan, he realized this doesn't work. And, and I, I find that what we realize, we've convinced ourselves this is easy and efficient. And in reality, if we really are monitoring, it's not easy and it's definitely not efficient. There are lots of issues with our current design. And the beauty about the living systems design is it just opens up the flexibility and the creativity and the innovation and every, everything doesn't have to be the same. We can contextualize it, design it, and create conditions that serve us versus try to create something that we want to model, duplicate, replicate, and then we lose all the meaning from it. Mm -hmm. So that's part of some of the approaches is I don't think it's tied to that scale, which we've been convinced is. Yeah, and I mean, it's also recognizing that, yes, there's people in organizations who have more, who will have more experience and in certain areas. And so it kind of shifts how you think about what would be typically a hierarchy, like maybe, you know, maybe in a living system, the role of what would be a senior manager or a director becomes like, how can I be a resource to help, you know, develop and grow and, you know, enhance the uniqueness of team members, you know, so it's kind of just shifting and playing with that, that approach, you know? Yeah. 
and one last thing I'll say, and I know it's it's over time, but yeah. and Alex has pointed this out through the entire presentation, but the biggest difference between the biggest core difference between the two system approaches is one's all about producti productivity and efficiency, and it isn't about the health of the system. It's productivity at all costs. We'll replace those parts. We'll replace those cogs. We'll just keep at it. In a living system, the only measure that matters is health. Because with health, we create conditions to allow for something emergent to happen, something innovative to happen, because we're creating the conditions for that creativity and innovation. So to me, one opens things up, one shuts it down. One's about pushing and pulling, the other is about creating conditions. And when we recognize that we're all living in a living system, and we start asking ourselves, senior management members in large organizations, what conditions are we creating? I'm afraid we're going to come back with some, oops, we're not creating really good conditions. Well, you know, I'm, I'm sure that we could stay here and chat all day, um, but want to be respectful of everyone's time. So Jen, any closing, any closing thoughts? And just thank you all really for being here and taking the time out of your day to be here with us. It's, you know, an honor to be able to share our work with you and to engage in conversation around it. So thank you. Oh, I just want to say thank you, Alex. Great thank job. You. And you, planting seeds for a lot of people today. Awesome. <laughs> Or um, continuing the growth. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks everyone. We'll hope you have a great day and thanks to the team as well. Um, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks everyone. Bye.